<clears throat> Dr. Hartle, you can start. All right, great, Tatiana. Thank you so much. This is uh, uh, Roger Hartle. Uh, welcome to Spine Time. I'm the uh, neurosurgical director of Wild Cornell, the spine surgery team here at uh, Cornell in Ox Spine. I'm also one of the co-directors of the Center for Comprehensive Spine Care that most of you are probably very familiar with. Every two weeks, we host a webinar where we invite practitioners from inside and sometimes from outside the spine group here to talk about topics that we think are important for patients to know about and that we know that patients have questions about. And today we chose physical therapy. Uh, a lot of you have experienced physical therapy over the years. Maybe you are actively involved in physical therapy right now. And I know that there are a lot of questions, uh, also things that I would love to talk about today. And uh, we have Dr. Michelle Chi and then uh, Ms. Tracy Maltz here today who are known to many of you as you kind of travel through the spine center and experience back issues and undergo treatment. So uh, great to have uh, those two individuals here. I'll, I'll introduce them a little bit more uh, later. For those of you who are not that familiar with the Center for Comprehensive Spine Care, we're located on 59th Street and 2nd Avenue. We're part of Wild Cornell, of course. And the idea really was to combine in one location everybody who treats patients with spine problems. And that is not only surgery, we have an orthopedic surgeon here, neurosurgical spine surgeons. We have a great team that uh, covers pain management, uh, rehabilitation uh, medicine, sports medicine. We have complement, we have uh, connections to complementary medicine. D Dr. Weaver is actually is uh, one of our neurologists. He actually is certified in integrative and complementary medicine. And then obviously we work with uh, psychologists, radiologists, and so forth, everything related to a spine problem that may come up from the diagnosis to the decision-making, the treatment, and then the rehabilitation after procedures or maybe after spine surgery. And as you kind of go through the process of having your spine, your neck, your back problem treated, you will frequently or usually you will encounter physical therapists sooner or later. And one of the best physical therapists that I've worked with over the years is Tracy Maltz, Miss Tracy Maltz, who is part of the group today. Thanks, uh, Tracy, for being here today. And she's the outpatient physical therapy supervisor at New York Presbyterian Hospital, uh, the Wild Cornell Medical Center. And uh, she's treated spine patients for, for many years. And again, thanks for being here, uh, Tracy. And then we have Dr. Chi. Dr. Chi is an assistant professor of clinical rehabilitation medicine here in the Spine Center and uh, also a face that's probably familiar to, to many of you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chi, for being here today. All right, so we'll, we'll get started. And I thought that, as always, we want to keep this conversational. We want to have the audience, patients, submit questions. There's a chat box here, and you're, you're welcome to submit questions. If, try to keep them relevant to, to the topic, of course. We'll screen, and if possible, we'll try to come up with, uh, we'll try to answer some of those questions or address some of the comments. Uh, we'll have uh, uh, Dr. Chi get started. She's going to talk about some of the common causes of back pain and neck pain. And then we'll have uh, uh, Ms. Maltz obviously comment on physical therapy options. And then we'll, we'll throw in a few questions. There are certain things that I kind of always wanted to know about physical therapy that I'll also try to bring in here. So, so Dr. Chi, thank you so much again for being here. And maybe uh, you want to get started. Why, why, does, why does my back hurt today? <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Hoddle, for the warm introduction. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> so why does my back hurt? So there's many different causes of back pain. Um, so it can be related to the muscles. It can come from the discs. It can come from joints, tiny little joints in the low back, and it can come from ligaments. So there's many different causes that can contribute to back pain. 
And oftentimes we have to go through different steps and a, you know, a, a thorough exam to really tease out what could be contributing. And sometimes it's just one thing and sometimes it's multiple things. Um, so it can be quite complex at times. Okay, we'll go to the next slide. So there are a lot of reasons why people can have uh, uh, back issues. Uh, so how, how do you how do you figure out if somebody shows up to your office, Dr. Chi, how do you figure out that somebody somebody has uh, a back pain from, you know, like you said, is, is it joint? Is it a disc? Is it lumbar stenosis? Yeah, so I, you know, I, I like to ask what kind of other symptoms that they have. So if they have signs of back pain and leg pain, that could indicate that they may have a disc component or disc, um, as you can see in that picture, that's irritating a nerve or pressing a nerve. And that would indicate that they may have a disc involvement. Um, also, what's important to, you know, when I ask patients about their history of their back pain, I like to ask, you know, what, what kind of positions seem to alleviate the symptoms and what kind of uh, positions or activities seem to aggravate certain symptoms. So some people uh, who have stenosis, which means that the, the spine is pinched um, and, and the canal is very tight, they prefer to sit down and lean forward because it relaxes and opens up the area of, of, of stenosis. But for someone that has a disc herniation or disc inflammation, irritation, disc injury, they would not typically not prefer to sit down because that actually puts much more pressure across um, uh, through, through the disc and, and pushes out against the nerves. So folks who have disc problems and disc herniations, uh, they, they actually prefer to walk and get up. So a lot of the times I'll see them in the office and they're actually not sitting on the table, they're, they're pacing, they're standing up pacing around because they can't actually sit because it's uncomfortable. So those are some of the few things I do when I'm asking patients about what, you know, what the cause of their back or what, what, what seems to aggravate their symptoms and what seems to help alleviate some of their symptoms to kind of tease out whether it's muscle, disc, or joint or stenosis. That's a great point. So uh, you, sometimes you can tell just you walk into the office and you can see somebody standing, you know, they don't <laughs> want to sit. They are mostly, and they have pain going down the right side of the leg, let's say. Now, very likely they have a herniated disc and other patients, you know, other patients may be sitting down. They have a hard time walking more likely to have lumbar spinal stenosis. I, you know, I, I was just wondering, Tracy, Tracy, I, I know Tracy very well. We're, we're very, very good friends. That's why I, I'm just going to call her Tracy, if you don't mind, you know, she calls me Roger. So, so, uh, you know, I, I, I apologize. I hope everybody is okay with that. So Tracy is a close friend and, and we know each other really well. So uh, Tracy, so, when you when you treat these patients, um, how do you, uh, you know, Dr. Chi just mentioned that certain patients are more comfortable sitting or standing. Is that something you take into consideration in the treatment? Is it is it that if you treat somebody somebody with lumbar spinal stenosis, you're gonna are you gonna are you gonna take that into consideration that they're more comfortable leaning forward, or is that something that's not really relevant? Do you treat do you treat by actually doing the opposite? Yeah, it's absolutely relevant. Um, thank you so much again for the warm introduction. And yes, we are great friends. And, you know, the respect that we have for each other as colleagues is, you know, supersedes all of that. And so I would just say that um, we want, you know, I think our bodies inform us on such a great level. And so I, I'm always doing a very comprehensive interview of a patient to really determine what makes them feel better and what makes them feel worse. You know, you bring up a really good point in that sometimes a position can make someone feel better temporarily. And essentially what we're looking for is really what's what makes someone feel better as a result of doing a certain motion. And oftentimes that's a repeated motion. So um, you can find that sometimes someone with a disc does like to be in a very, you know, likes to lean forward and touch their toes because it actually in some sense accommodates for that pain every now and then. It's a rarity, but uh, it can be misleading to us as clinicians. Um, but what we know is that leaning forward most often when it's a disc is not the best movement for that in order to treat that source of the symptoms. And so it's not always what you feel in that moment, but also as a result of doing a motion. And so in physical therapy, we're often gonna look at a repeated motion to determine what that repeated motion actually does to the symptoms. And that will often inform the rest of our treatment. 
Now, when I look at this image that Dr. Chi put here, it's it's quite a dramatic image. If you if you look at the nerve and you see that disc uh, pushing into that nerve, you know, causing severe compression. How does physical therapy? How can you how can you use physical therapy to maybe over time reduce that compression or to have that disc kind of go back into place where it used to be? A lot of patients ask me that, and I'm always wondering. Is it more just waiting that nature kind of heals itself? Or is there something that you can actually act actively do with physical therapy that actually brings that, pulls that disc herniation back into place? I mean, yes to both. I mean, we know that 60 to 80% of back pain gets better by itself. And what we also know about back pain is that it tends to have a vengeance when it comes back. So it often comes back with a little bit more pain or more um, functional limitation, or it tends to show up maybe sometimes not just in the back, but then it starts moving into the buttocks or the leg. And so the idea with physical therapy is number one, to see if the mechanics of the body um, can actually help relocate the pressure that's on the nerve so that it removes the pressure from the nerve and thereby reduces the pain or um, removes pressure from the nerve that may be, you know, not f giving the right information to a muscle. So then we can restore strength as well. Um, and then the other really important piece of physical therapy is to see if we can teach the patient to have some kind of independent management of their symptoms so that if it does return, they know what to do about it instead of allowing it to get really aggravated before they are able to reach someone to help take care of it. So. Right. Now we, we have a lot of comments in the chat box, but you know, uh, one of the uh, uh, one of the aud audience members says, "I have a herniated disc, and a good PT makes all the difference." So, so that's great. But um, Tracy, tell us two or three exercises. Somebody with a lumbar disc herniation, what are like two or three? exercises that you would typically recommend? Well, it's a hard question to answer because basically um, everybody has what we call comorbidities, other things going on at the same time. Uh, it's been around for different periods of time. They've had different surgeries. They've had other procedures um, that might impact this. But I would say if I had to pick a couple exercises for a very typical presentation of a herniated disc, most often, we would have someone walking in a very upright position. We would have someone lying on their bellies, maybe propping themselves up on a couple pillows or propping themselves up on their elbows or doing, as I said before, the repeated movement of actually doing a press up where they move their back into further extension. Now, oftentimes that can feel terrible when you first start doing it. So essentially what we're also looking for is how it continues to respond to a repeated movement. So um, definitely looking towards reducing a disc herniation through uh, spinal extension. And again, that's really dealing with a typical presentation. And as we know, there's, there's atypical presentations all the time. That's true. So yeah, always do this obviously under uh, surveillance and, and direction of uh, the physician or the physical therapist. Now let's move on. Maybe Dr. Chi will uh, uh, we'll move on uh, talk a little bit about disc here, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so as I mentioned, yeah, yeah. So, so the discs are actually very fluid. So it's kind of like how you would think about uh, jelly in a donut. So it's constantly under pressure mm -hmm. and it's almost 70 to 90% water, especially in the middle. So because of that, it's constantly in motion and flux depending on different positions. So how we're sitting, how we're standing can actually um, really compromise um, our discs and, and cause injury down the road. So this is just a very uh, popular diagram that we use to show some of our patients of how um, different positions can add a lot more stress and pressure on the discs um, and, and potentially lead to disc injury and disc herniation. So if standing is your baseline at 100%, once you sit down, it's 50% more pressure on the discs. Um, if you were to sit down and hunch forward and lean forward to look at the screen, do, do you know, work from home, you're, you're actually almost twice as much, you're putting almost twice as much pressure on uh, the disc as you would be if you were just standing. So typically, you know, it's, I, I usually try, when, when folks have disc problems and disc herniation related pain, 
um, and they're working from home, uh, which many are lately, uh, I usually recommend keeping a good balance of sitting and standing and modifying their workstation. So, um, you know, when you're sitting, I, I kind of, I, I give recommendations put, such as putting an alarm or setting up an alarm to get up every hour and then vice versa. Um, every hour of standing, you wanna kind of transition to a sitting position. Um, also when, when, when folks are sitting, kind of also depends on how you're sitting. So if you're sitting without any back support, you're naturally gonna hunch forward and, and the disc is then undergo more pressure as you can see um, in the diagram of almost twice as much pressure. But if you have a proper uh, backrest, and sometimes I recommend having folks put like a rolled towel or a small pillow right where that small of their back is so that they can re uh, relax and, and put some and alleviate some of the pressure across uh, the disc, that tends to be helpful and, and can alleviate some of the pressure that, uh, that is placed upon the disc with sitting. So, so those are some of the ergonomic uh, adjustments and recommendations I make to some patients who have disc-related pain. So this diagram can sometimes be helpful to really remind folks what they're doing to their discs when they're in different uh, positions in their day-to-day -day activities. No, you know, this is really fascinating. It really goes back to what we talked about before. So if you see a, somebody with a disc problem, like a herniated disc, they're comfortable or more comfortable standing up because their pressure is at baseline, but leaning forward and sitting down they don't like to do that. And that's exactly what we see in the office and what we talked about. I, I was wondering, I would like to see a diagram here of uh, the exercise that Tracy recommended with you know, lying on your stomach, propping up. So going in hyperextension, lying down, whether that actually further decreases the pressure in the disc. And maybe that's why uh, that type of exercise is beneficial. But certainly leaning forward and standing uh, and, 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 and you know, sitting forward causes more brings more pressure on the disc and therefore is not good for patients with disc herniation. So, uh, so that, 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 that's really uh, great. Let's talk. Yeah. So we had the question, I think before about joint, uh, joint issues in, in the spine causing pain. And here we've got some drawings, Dr. Chi, do you want to walk us through this? Yeah. So um, as I mentioned earlier, as far as different causes of back pain, we have discs, we have muscles and, and joints. So facet joints are these little, I like to describe them as like little knuckle joints. They extend from basically the base of your skull or the top of your cervical, your neck, and it extends all the way down to near your tailbone. And they're basically on both sides of your spine and, and they support your spine and your spinal cord. So they're very important structures, but because there are they are little joints, they're prone to injury, they're prone to developing inflammation, just like you would with a knee joint or a shoulder joint. And sometimes because they are joints, uh, arthritis can also develop down the, down the road. And so uh, irritation of those joints can oftentimes cause back pain, um, not just back pain, but sometimes those joints can cause pain going down the leg in certain distributions. So that diagram in the lower right corner shows how some of the, the joints can refer in different ways. So sometimes it can go down the back of the thigh, uh, even though it's not actually a pinched nerve. And sometimes it can radiate to the side or a little bit in the front of the thigh. Um, and that's just how these joints can refer. So um, there's a lot of overlap between disc pain and joint pain and, and, and disc herniation, sciatica type pain too. Yeah, that's interesting how it kind of projects to different body you know, surface areas and you can uh, draw a conclusion based on where the pain is, which joint may be affected. I know the same is the case in the cervical spine as well. I have a hard time imagining, Tracy, how the physical therapy can really help this condition. What, what, what's your, what's your uh, take on this? Yeah, I think it's just a matter of really determining what the source of the symptoms is. And so, uh, and watching how someone responds to physical therapy and that, you know, how someone responds often really guides the next steps. So one of the things, you know, that part of the title of this lecture is what works and what doesn't. And, you know, I think it's so important to be very involved as a clinician in observing exactly how your patient's responding to physical therapy so that you can, get them to the next level of care um, if they're not responding to physical therapy for one reason or another. And I think that's 
why the, the whole system of the Spine Center works so effectively because we work very closely as a team and, and are able to refer amongst each other so that we can get our patients to the best level of care if it's not responding. So there's no specific physical therapy for patients with facet pain, I assume, but, but uh, it's more like, uh, uh, you know, what, what, what would you, if, if you know somebody's got facet disease and they come to you and they, you know, uh, Dr. Maltz, show me the exercise for, for facet disease. There's, there's no particular exercise, is that correct? Well, I would say, you know, it really falls in line with what I said before. You know, what we see on diagnostic tests is that we can see that there's inflammation of the facets. We really want to see how it acts. When you look anatomically and mechanically at the facet joint, we know that probably bending forward might feel a little bit better for that patient because they actually, in that case, unload their facets. And so, yeah, as you see from other diagrams, you can really see that, um, bending forward can sometimes feel good for these patients. So again, listening to what someone's um, subjective report is and what they prefer to do for pain relief often can guide whether or not that bending forward in that case, it would be bringing like knees to chest um, or really just working on a neutral posture so that you're not overloading facet joints. Right. Now there are a lot of uh, questions here and, and a lot of things that, that, I think are really important. One question was, first of all, somebody asked about lumbar stenosis in physical therapy, and we'll, we'll get there in a few minutes, I'm sure, because it, it, it is a very important topic. But what about ice, uh, heat, heat or ice or cold? Uh, maybe not in relationship to facet joints, but I, I assume you know, muscular, post-surgical pain. What are your recommendations? Again, what's the big picture? When, when should patients consider heat versus cold? Maybe Dr. Chi? Yeah, so typically from a uh, acuity of the situation where there was an acute injury or you, you know, stubbed your toe or you, you fell and, and, you, and you injured or you landed on your back. So for acute type of pain and post-surgical uh, or post even post-injection or post-procedural pain, which is acute, um, I typically recommend ICE because ICE is a great anti-inflammatory, much like taking an Aleve or an Advil that is not a medicine, but just ICE. So I usually recommend using a cold pack, you know, about 10 minutes to 15 minutes, two to three times a day when they're having any acute injuries. So um, that's how I recommend ICE. And then for heat, I usually say, you know, for kind of chronic aching pain or muscle tightness and muscle fatigue, heat tends to kind of relax the muscles. So folks like to wear towards the end of the day when the muscles are, are tight and tense, and that seems to help for more of that chronic aching type of, uh, type of pain. Got it. Yeah, that depends. So now we're coming to an important topic here on the right side. You can see lumbar spinal stenosis. So that's compression of the nerves in, in, the, in the lower part of the lumbar spine. And that can cause the condition that we talked about before, what we call neurogenic claudication. So patients have a hard time standing, walking. They sit down, they lean forward, and they find relief. Frequently treated surgically, but not as the first option. That was another question. Uh, obviously, always try to do non-operative treatment first. And that includes potentially, and I'm going to speak for you now, Dr. Chi, I apologize, but injections. Uh, obviously a careful neurological evaluation, but in terms of physical therapy for lumbar spinal stenosis, and I know there are patients who have terrible lumbar stenosis and they, they manage over the years. And, and we had a, um, you know, physiatrist, Dr. Nagler, who retired, who was famous for treating patients non-operatively with physical therapy for severe lumbar stenosis. And that frequently worked. Uh, how, how, why did that work, Tracy? How, how do you how do you how do you get patients to respond successfully to physical therapy? Well, oh, there's so many pieces to that question. I would say when it comes to stenosis, um, we know that there's a bony pressure that's being placed on the nerve, and so the idea is how can we remove the bony pressure that's on the nerve for long enough that it actually will reduce the inflammation that's surrounding that scenario and feel a little bit better. So with someone with stenosis, we really encourage flexion. Um, flexion means bending forward. So when you talk to someone who has pretty bad stenosis, 
um, we might not encourage a really upright posture in this case is we would maybe encourage someone to sit in somewhat of a forward posture so that they could reduce the pressure on the nerve and allow themselves to reduce the inflammation in that area. So it's a lot of teaching. We don't want to continue to contribute to the forward flexed position so that someone goes into too far of a forward flexed position that actually stabilizes themselves uh, by building up muscles. So we'll work on abdominal muscles, we'll do pelvic tilts in these scenarios and really teach these patients to accommodate to the pain that their body is giving them so that hopefully we can roll them out of the episode of inflammation that they're experiencing. That sounds like a lot of work for you and for the patient. How often do you uh, recommend physical therapy? You know, we really want to see it work. I mean, we, you guys are recommending physical therapy and we're, we're really looking to see that a patient responds to it. And again, you know, if we're not seeing a response, then we will certainly move that patient to the next level of care. That being said, I think you bring up a really important question and that is like, how, you know, it does, it does, um, call on the patient to be really active. So, you know, when people come to physical therapy, they are signing up to take a really active role in their own healing and understand that there's a lot of exercises that they're gonna need to do at home that will efficiently and effectively treat those symptoms. But it take, you know, we're looking for the patient to be extremely active in their care. A, f a few more questions. Now, when I sent, you know, I sent, all, essentially all of my patients I sent to physical therapy. And then sometimes they come back a few weeks later, a few months later, and they say, well, I walked into the physical therapy office and they put me in a corner on a bench. They put a you know, patch on me and then they let that, you know, like a tense unit or whatever. And then, and then I, I was lying there for 45 minutes. Nobody did anything. And, and then I went home and I do that three times a week and they call that physical therapy. It's a real problem, right? I mean, yeah. how, do you, how, do you, how do you pick a physical therapy place uh, for a patient that actually does the types of, you know, I assume for mostly really physical, it's a lot of work for the patient also. It's not just lying there, but how do you find a good physical therapy place? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, it hurts my ears to hear those same complaints from our patients. We're often hearing that someone got physical therapy somewhere else and might say it didn't work, but when we ask them, when it's pro that question is actually probed, we can determine that actually what happened in physical therapy was not active or was not a, in a one-on-one -on -one situation. And so we really do pride ourselves here at the hospital in treating our patients one-on-one. -on -one. We are very closely monitoring what their responses are to exercise. And we have a really high expectations that our patients are taking a very active role in their own treatment. Um, so I would look for all of those components in any physical therapy setting that you're going to. You also naturally want to make it pretty convenient for yourself because it's not something that you go to just once a month. It is something that you'll go to on a more consistent basis. So if it's very difficult for you to get there and that will, you know, have implications related to your compliance, then, you know, it's best to find something close, but definitely be looking for a place where you get one-on-one -on -one attention and that you feel like your symptoms are changing for the better. Dr. Chi, I want to, I don't want to take over. So if you have any questions or, or comments, please feel free. I, I, I would have one more, I, I get so, you know, I'm so happy to be able to talk to uh, both of you. I have one question for Tracy about physical therapy patients going to a physical therapy location or sometimes we have patients who who want the physical therapist to come to their home what what are the big differences what are the pros and cons um, most often the only way that physical therapy is covered by insurance if someone comes to your home is if you actually qualify for not being able to leave your home, physically able to leave your home to go to a clinic. And so we offer uh, physical therapy here and we do take uh, most insurance. When someone comes to your home, they most often do not take insurance. And I know I'm speaking really broadly and, and I'm sure there's different scenarios where someone, you may be able to get home therapy where someone does cover it, but that's, that's typically our understanding here at the hospital. And so, uh, we do offer both private physical therapy where someone would come 
to your home and that would be, you know, just fee for service. And then we offer physical therapy here at the hospital um, and we take insurance. Great. Maybe Dr. Chi, you wanna walk us through this slide? Yeah, so I'm sure Tracy will be able to kind of go over some of these in more detail, but just broadly speaking, um, I mean, not everyone is a cookie cutter textbook picture as far as what exercise is good for what type of pathology, but so this is really more on a general basis. Um, but when, when, when patients have disc herniations or disc injury, disc tears, I usually recommend focusing on the core because when you, when you strengthen the core, the back does less work and there's less strain on the discs and less pressure on the disc. So you really wanna think about really strengthening all the muscles around the spine so, um, so that the back of the spine isn't working so hard and you're also relieving the pressure on the discs. So um, planks and variations of planks are just one easy type of exercise um, that I recommend for disc herniations because it focuses on working on your core, but also keeping a neutral spine. So um, I try to uh, have patients try to avoid um, extreme flexion-based core exercises. So a full sit-up can sometimes cause worsening pain. Um, so I, I try to kind of guide them towards doing more core exercises that are a little bit more neutral. So just a straight spine. Are sit-ups sit dangerous? I'm sorry. Sit-ups, are they dangerous? Sit-ups are da dangerous, but that that flexion movement where you're sitting all the way up and add a little bit more pressure on the discs. So that might take long, it might take longer for the disc to heal if it's trying to push back rather than push or push forward rather than push back to where it needs to go. Um, so 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 I, I, I usually say avoid a full setup, although crunches I think are fine because it's not a full setup and you're likely not going to jeopardize the discs in your spine. Um, but if, if I were to choose what's a good core, I would say, or not a good core, I would say a full set of is probably not a, an exercise I would recommend at least early on until they're uh, fully recovered or close to being fully recovered. Um, as far as some of these other joint pains for, for the facet joints, those, those little joints that can cause back pain. Um, I know Tracy mentioned pelvic tilts. I think those, those exercises and exercises that essentially elongate the spine and relieve some of the pressure on the joints are good. So kind of a mini flexion based exercise or stretching exercise can be helpful. Um, I just have a photo on the right. It's a, a modification of a child's pose type, type of uh, diagram. And that can sometimes elongate those little joints and relieve the pressure and also alleviate pain. So those and pelvic tilts are some just general exercises that can help with the pain uh, that can come from the facet joints um, and, and, and the stenosis, uh, as, as we had discussed before, the flexion based exercises where you're opening up the spine rather than adding more tension and the spine tends to be helpful for both back pain and leg symptoms and leg pain. Yeah. So that, that means that it's really important for patients to have an understanding as to where the pain is coming from, correct? So it's not like you've got back pain and there's like one exercise that you should be doing. You should really probably seek out advice and, you know, diagnostic help in figuring out, well, do I have, you know, a herniated disc? Do I have lumbar stenosis? Is it more degenerative disc disease? Is it facet pain? And then, and then really tailor your physical therapy based on with accurate diagnosis. Is that, is that fair? Yeah, definitely. And, and it can be challenging because some people have both disc herniations and facet pain and a combination of stenosis. So sometimes you just need to work with the patient and see what alleviates their symptoms and what positions or di directions tend to aggravate the symptoms and try to find a healthy balance. And that's when physical therapy can also be really helpful in in guiding patients on what's what's a good balance for both someone that has a disc herniation and, and a component of facet pain as well. Right. Yeah, I just wanna add to that and say that oftentimes we, um, people get an MRI or they get some kind of diagnostic study and all of these 
subcategories are listed as a result on the MRI. And so it can be a little confusing for the patient to determine exactly which exercise or which movement is best to do that will serve them. And so what we do in physical therapy and what we do in our um, in physician's offices when we're evaluating the symptoms is we try to determine which of those components are kind of like playing in the front of the stage so that we can really um, treat them in a way that doesn't necessarily create like, you know, for lack of a better term, almost like a whack-a-mole where you treat something, you treat one thing and something else gets better or, uh, you, or something else gets worse. And so um, we're always trying to make sure that we're treating uh, the pain in a way that is, um, that we're expecting a specific response. We're seeing that, we know it's predictable, and then we continue to work in a very deliberate fashion. And so we do encourage patients to get to seek professional help, um, particularly if whatever you've tried at home is not working. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And I, uh, you know, there was a, uh, they're, they're gone now, so I can probably talk about the Laser Spine Institute. You would send them your MRI report and they would send you back the surgical options based on the MRI report without ever looking at the patient. I thought that was terrible and they obviously didn't survive uh, because people realized that this was just not a good way to practice medicine, certainly not a good way to practice you know, spine related medicine. So it's not only what the MRI scan shows because everybody, all of us have, you know, to a certain extent, we've got disc herniations, we've got facet disease, we've got probably spinal stenosis. It doesn't mean that that's the actual reason why you have the type of pain that you're having. So you need to really be evaluated by a physician by a good physical therapist to figure out, well, what's really causing the pain and then make that the guiding, uh, 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 you know, the guiding principle for, for your treatment. So that, that, that's important. Now, uh, before we talk a little bit more about types of physical therapy, uh, let's talk a little bit about prevention. Uh, this is my favorite slide and, and you, you probably haven't seen this before, but this is from a physical therapy journal was published years ago, but essentially what it shows is that you know, if you have a, there's a sweet spot for, for patients uh, where they can minimize the amount of back pain. And, and that's related to the level of intensi intensity in terms of physical ex exercise. So if you, if, you, if you don't exercise at all, which would be you're inactive, you're on the left side of this curve, there's a higher chance that you have low back pain. If you do too much, there's a higher chance, but there's like the sweet spot where you're active, where you do, you know, on a regular basis, engage in, in different types of physical therapy. Maybe a few words from, from both of you about what, what do you think is a, is a reasonable amount of exercise, physical therapy, physical activity uh, for somebody, especially now in these you know, difficult days with uh, COVID and so forth, to, to, to minimize the risk of developing back and neck issues? Maybe Dr. Chi. Yeah, so, you know, I see a lot of patients who are really eager to get back to weightlifting and going on 30 mile, you know, <laughs> marathons and, 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 and wanting to play tennis and, and, and getting back into golf. So um, I see a lot of patients that are really eager to jump into their almost maximum activity um, soon after an injury um, or, or a back problem. And so I, I really encourage these patients to really work with the physical therapist first for any kind of functional goals, whether it's getting back into, you know, any of these activities. And so I, I really like to go slow, but progress at the level of, of where they're functioning. So um, I usually kind of auto just generalize it by saying, you know, try at least minimize to about 20 to 50% of your typical uh, activity and see how your pain is. Um, and then kind of slowly progress that to 70 and 80% and see whether you have more pain with doing too much of, of whatever that activity might be. And you might have, and then I'll tell them to kind of back off a little bit and go back because they're not there yet and, and kind of work with them. And I think that's when physical therapy tends to be really helpful because they can really work with kind of simulating that environment, whether it's going for a jog or, or sprinting and seeing where where they're, where they're having more pain and, and really kind of do some fine, fine tuning of where that, where that sweet spot is. Yeah. Yeah. One of the, 
the challenges really with back issues is that the pain doesn't happen immediately. You know, frequently patients do something, they lift something heavy or they, you know, they go for a run and it's not like they have pain while they're running or while they're lifting. Sometimes it happens the next day. So there's no, not always a temporal relationship between what you do and then the type of pain that you cause. And I don't know exactly why that is, but I see it all the time in my patients. So, so you really have to kind of listen to your body, not only while you're doing it, but then also the following day and, you know, be aware that you have to make that connection. So it's, it, it can be, it can be really challenging. Uh, uh, Tracy, what type of, uh, you know, what about running, for example, running, swimming, elliptical, anything that's better in general, better for your back than others? Well, it really depends on what the diagnosis is. It really depends on what we're working with. So uh, I think I think so many important uh, points were mentioned there. What we do know for sure is that movement is medicine. And what we do know for sure is that we uh, want to encourage movement as quickly and safely as possible. And so uh, the, the idea that you should hang it, yeah, this is, this is one of my slides and, you know, really, you know, exercise, 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 and whatever that might mean to you. And so we definitely encourage people to do what's meaningful to them, that brings them some source of, of pleasure and joy, you know, in the form of exercise. And then really that they're increasing it at very small increments so that they can get that feedback, exactly what you were saying. You know, if you go for a walk and it felt great, instead of doubling that distance the next day, maybe just increase the distance by just a couple minutes or just by a couple uh, kilometers, just so that you really get a sense of exactly how your body is responding to it and keep yourself in that safe space. Um, but definitely getting moving is really important. Now, um, Tracy, my favorite topic, Feldenkrais, Alexander Technique, and McKenzie. Yes. Tell, tell us the uh, differences. Well, I would say for sure, one of the things that we know um, is that there's different approaches to treatment and there wouldn't be these approaches if they didn't work for, for various individuals. I happen to be a physical therapist that is certified in the McKenzie Technique. Um, and the <clears throat> technique is a technique that looks at movements of the spine as well as peripheral joints, meaning your legs and um, your knees and your hips and your ankles, as well as your wrists and shoulders um, from, what, from a repeated movement perspective to see if we can learn about the patterns of symptoms that show up and then see if they then fit into some kind of um, pattern where we can work to give you an exercise that will help reduce the pain based on what we call a directional preference, meaning your body's kind of showing us that it prefers to move in a certain direction versus another. And then we kind of plug that into exercises. Um, I am not a Feldenkrais or Alexander Technique um, certified clinician. And so I will only speak to those to, um, approaches pretty superficially, just because I want to really do them uh, the due diligence that they deserve. And I'm, I'm, Sure, I don't properly speak really comprehensively about either of them, but the Feldenkrais method is a type of an alternative exercise therapy um, that really looks at repairing, um, kind of repairing impaired connections in the motor cortex in the brain and the body. So really looking at the quality of body movement and well-being of the patient. And so looking to see if there's uh, I think they both kind of look at habitual movement patterns that we tend towards as individuals and, and see whether or not those, um, those movement patterns are considered inefficient or strained. And if there's something actually that can be reintroduced where that movement pattern is less strained or more natural or feels like there's more ease associated with it. And so really just looking to see um, kind of what we've done over time to undo the ease of movement in our body and recreate easy um, access to those movements. So it's almost like mind-body. It's definitely mind-body, yeah, on all of them. Huh. And then Alexander Technique? So Alexander Technique really, I think, you know, from that perspective, the, the uh, Alexander teacher is really looking at balancing a, a, a 
you know, what they call their students supportive musculature as it relates to gravity. So they're looking at sit to stand, they're looking at going up steps and walking. Um, and they're really looking at how you respond to gravity with your movements. There's a lot of hands on with Alexander Technique. Um, and they are looking again at habitual movement patterns and just really seeing how they can guide and prevent unnecessary habits um, that may limit your movement. So, you know, they're, they're both very complex techniques. I know with regards to Alexander Technique, there's thousands of hours that need to be, um, that are included in the training over many years. And so I'm sure that there is a much more comprehensive um, description of what can be used, but I've seen them both work really beautifully with patients. And so if that's something that resonates with you, you know, they're, they're easily accessible within New York City for sure. Yeah, and then there's a question about Tai Chi. So we had a webinar two weeks ago about, uh, two weeks ago about Tai Chi with Yang Yang, who's a, a very uh, respected you know, Tai Chi master. So I encourage all of you who have an interest, you can pull up the, uh, the webinar on YouTube uh, at the, um, the Wild Cornell location. Uh, we had 45 minutes about Tai Chi. We also had a patient there who uh, used Tai Chi post-operatively to recover. I thought that was a really nice conversation, but it's interesting. I mean, it's fascinating. So it really depends also on, on, on the patient's kind of philosophy or preference as to what they want to choose in terms of physical therapy. So there's some basic principles as you, as, as both of you kind of mentioned, but then on top of that, there's, it really becomes also preference, patient preference to a certain extent, what should be done and whatnot. I think we got to finish up uh, it's been a fascinating 47, 48 minutes. Uh, Dr. Chi, any, any closing remarks? You, you walked us you know, brilliantly through the physiology, pathophysiology of back issues. And uh, you didn't get to talk a lot about the things that you do to treat back pain, but, but you certainly uh, enlightened us in terms of what can cause back pain. Uh, any, any closing remarks from your part? Yeah, um, so I really want to encourage patients out there to really listen to their body and keep an eye on what, what is aggravating the symptoms and what's making their symptoms uh, better uh, and, and keeping a good pain diary when they're, when they're having any, any back pain or, or, or neck pain and you know, really finding and, and getting care early if it doesn't, if it doesn't improve with, with just a simple stretch or, or rest and ice um, because Tracy and I can really help you, and so can Dr. Hartle and in many ways, and we really collaborate um, on, on, on care. So, All right. So anybody who uh, needs help in terms of their back issues, of course, neck issues, physical therapy, these are our contact numbers and, and the website. Uh, we're happy to get you in touch with Tracy and her team at NYP, a great physical therapist. All of them, I've worked with all of them over the years. Uh, we also work with some of the physical therapists outside, of course, and uh, we try to really make sure that wherever we sent you, you're going to be in good hands. And um, again, Dr. Chi, uh, Tracy, thank you so much. Thanks, Tatiana, Roseanne, for putting this together, and Susan Conroy. And uh, looking forward to meeting you again soon, of course, in two weeks. I think in two weeks, we ha we'll probably have another webinar uh, if you if you're interested, you can look look it up online. The topic, but we'll talk about a lot of interesting things going forward. Cervical spine. We'll talk about acupuncture, navigation, minimal invasive spine surgery. We have a webinar about genetics. A lot of patients are interested in the genetic component because back pain, neck issues run in families. So we'll talk about that. So thanks. Have a lovely evening and all the best. Thanks so much. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Hartle. Thank you.